<clears throat> I, I would like to acknowledge the Guana people who are the historical and traditional owners of the land on which this convention center is built. Thank you very much, Peter, for the kind words, which I can only say can only be seen as being deserved if they're shared with an enormous number of people, some of them in this room, as I will try to demonstrate over the next uh, 45 minutes or so. It is now 20 years, practically to the day, since I first uh, attended and spoke uh, at a meeting of this distinguished society, which actually also happens to be in this uh, fine Australian city of Adelaide. Um, I didn't think I'd ever be addressing this society in this context, and um, I'm struggling with a Bob Hawke moment at the, mo at the moment, so um, I'd ask you to please uh, bear with me if occasionally uh, this shows. I, uh, disclosures and disclaimers, um, I earn a living these days from uh, compensation to uh, various uh, blood-related agencies. And of course, I always have to make the disclaimers I used to do when in the government that none of these views express uh, the, uh, the, those of any of my past or current affiliations. It never prevented me from getting into trouble when I was in the government, so I don't expect it to have any difference. I am the unworthy uh, successor of a variety of, of a long uh, range of orators uh, honoring this uh, fine Australian and there is very little more that I can add to what has already been said over the years and to the intro uh, excellent introduction of Dr. Flanagan. Ruth Sanger, as he has told you, was definitely one of us. She was born and received her first education in Queensland before getting her first degree in Sydney at the only university which existed at the time. And this then led to her eventually joining the blood transfusion service in Sydney. This is a well-known picture which appeared in transfusion some years ago of Root, uh, no doubt in her TGA and NATA and ABB accredited laboratory in about 1946, um, uh, no doubt uh, initiating her interest in, in blood groups. She then uh, moved to the United Kingdom initially on a temporary basis to join Rob Sanger at his, by then, already world-famous uh, blood group MRC-funded research unit in London. And thus began one of the most productive collaborations in our field, which led, as has been said, to the uh, production of this famous book. This is my own uh, veteran, rather battered copy of Race and Sanger, which I remember buying pretty early on in my career in 1979 in Malta for, I think it was quite a, a substantial sum at that time. It has accompanied me all the years that I have been uh, traveling around the world. I was struck yesterday listening to the beautiful um, molecular biology uh, underpinning the work of Cathy Highland's group in, in Brisbane that uh, at the time when Ruth and Rob race were uh, developing all their work, none of these marvelous techniques existed. And yes, we have all this work now uh, to always reflect upon. The book is a beautiful book, even if in terms of the science it is perhaps a little outdated. Um, it still bears a read and is characterized by what I would like to think as a strong streak of Aussie humor. Um, she uh, then continued her career and took over the unit after uh, Race, who besides being her collaborator, eventually became her lifelong partner, uh, uh, retired. And we are here to honor this fine woman. Now, a lot is said about the brain drain in relation to scientists in Australia. I must confess I do not feel the same emotion as most people do. I think the fact that Root and other Australians have moved from these shores has not necessarily been always a bad thing and that they have contributed to the human race irrespective and sometimes perhaps given that particularly female scientists are still not given sufficient uh, acknowledgement in this country uh, as seen 
from this uh, news item from yesterday's ABC, um, perhaps it is just as well. I would like to round off my remarks on Ruth Sanger. I cannot do better than to quote from Bob Beale's obituary uh, from some years ago, published in our newsletter, that she was a most distinguished Australian scientist who contributed uniquely to our knowledge of immunohematology. She was intellectually honest and devastatingly frank, as only expatriate Australians can be, and was nevertheless a wonderfully warm, outgoing, friendly human being whose encouragement, friendship, simulation and support meant a great deal to an enormous number of workers in our field. To that I add that, like Abraham Lincoln, she belongs to I'm going to give a very personal perspective, and uh, Peter has alluded, as he always does, to the fact that I am sometimes somewhat controversial. Uh, this is an entirely personal perspective on the way I have seen the field develop in some ways. It is especially colored by some of my experiences, particularly those in the TGA. Um, and it is summarized in this uh, slide here. I'm going to philosophize, as is somewhat my want, draw some thoughts from epistemology, some from sociology, and some from transfusion medicine, and some from regulation. I'm going to, over the course of this talk, acknowledge many people, but I will also round off with some acknowledgements and with some final reflections. I will be controversial. I'm sure that many of you will not agree with some of the points, but I assure you they are made from a perspective of respect and love for this field. To be verified by observation and experiment, scientists are part of the human race. And it is the case that the human race has this chronic need for certainty and security. It must have comforted one of the fathers of medicine a lot to think that he was living in an era of such perfection. Um, in our age, we have various issues to deal with which are carved out through the path of science. One of our biggest issues is the issue of climate change and global warming, which I observe with interest is also pinned down by so-called scientific certainty. And this is shown in uh, this uh, slide from this uh, individual a journalist who is uh, asserting that it's 90%, which is about as certain as scientists ever get. It's interesting that there is this uh, statement about scientists. I'm not going to um, give my views on global warming, except that I think that our posture on global warming is a fairly straightforward application of a principle which we know about very well in this field, which is precautionism. But I now turn to scientific figures as opposed to journalists. Um, William Thompson who developed a lot of the classical physics of the Victorian era, particularly the laws, the first and second laws of thermodynamics, summarized the typical um, benign arrogance of the Victorians at the end of their era when they were satisfied that they'd painted the world red and had, in fact, done and found it all by saying that there was nothing new to be discovered in physics and all that remained was more and more precise measurement and he said this in 1900, five years before an obscure clerk working in the Bern patent office turned the whole world of, of physics and the perceptions of nature upside down. It is interesting that Albert Einstein denied the whole idea that there was such a thing as certainty in many statements, including the one you see over here. I want to come to somebody who is a very interesting philosopher in terms of the philosophy of science. I commend your attention to his works. They are not easy. I would advise you to start from you know, some basic interpretations and work your way up, as I did. But Karl Popper was very eminent in the philosophy of science, and he developed the concept of falsiability, which basically states that a scientific theory can only be considered as such if it can eventually be shown to be susceptible to being proved wrong. I think that this is a very interesting concept. It is controversial. It has been the subject of vigorous debate among philosophers and epistemologists, but it is one for which I personally have a certain level of respect and appeal.
Popper also discussed the issue of common sense, which is a concept which I find, again, very interesting. He said that he had a lot of respect for it, but you needed to tread warily in its presence. Sorry about the uh, crowded slides. As usual, Farouk is trying to get away with more slides by putting two slides and three slides into one. This is essentially, this is essentially a summary of Popper's uh, uh, concept of falsificationism. It is very much my own interpretation as an inexpert person in a complex field. But I think scientists need to understand the philosophical underpinnings of their sciences as much as they need to understand the concepts of physical sciences and the interpretation of data. The important point about Popper's concept is, as I said, that a scientific theory can actually never be said that it is true. It has always got to be tested against the concept of being shown to be wrong. And he refutes so-called theories which cannot be illustrative of this concept. It is a very interesting way of observing the development of all branches of science. Here is an interesting example. Benjamin Rush was one of the um, signers of the United States Declaration of Independence. He was also a doctor. And he believed, like a lot of doctors at that time, that bloodletting was a good thing and that the best treatment for yellow fever was in fact bloodletting. And if the patient in his view got better, it was because of bloodletting, and if the patient died, it was because he was too sick anyway and no treatment would work. I somehow see a resonance in this in many, uh, <laughs> in many statements in science and medical care even today. But I think that this is illustrative of one of the cardinal errors in scientific thinking because Benjamin Rush, despite his eminence and his justifiable place in medical history, his theory. Many years ago, when I was in fact still an undergraduate in Malta, <coughs> I was made aware of Thomas Kuhn and this famous book and I commend it to your attention. It is one of the most important books in scientific thinking and scientific philosophy and it is eminently readable infinitely more readable, in fact, than much of Popper's work, perhaps because Kuhn uh, is more akin to us in being primarily uh, writing in English. Um, it has been immensely influential and has sold a lot of copies. It remains, like Popper's work, a very controversial area. Kuhn actually doesn't agree with Popper, if you read his book, but I see enormous convergences between their thinking. Um, the word paradigm is used very liberally, sometimes quite loosely. It has been used in this conference, uh, incidentally not loosely, it has been used in the correct way. Paradigms, which is this concept which Kuhn developed, are essentially our worldview in various things. And there are various synonyms, and observe the synonym because it includes common sense. We may not be even aware of these because we take them for granted. And many times we live in a, uh, a group and interact professionally in a comfort zone which uh, includes people who are all sharing our paradigms and we don't encounter any different ones, so we're not actually aware that we're in a Kuhn maintained that science is based on paradigms, not necessarily methods or sets of facts. And that in fact science, unlike some interpretations of the scientific method which I have seen, which view the progression of science as being an inevitable slow uh, development in progress, Kuhn maintained that progress in science has always been discontinuous and revolutionary and therefore, Mr. Chairman, controversial. And certainly, and I emphasize this because I will come again to the concept of consensus, certainly not consensual, and that therefore scientific revolutions involve the replacement of one paradigm by another. They involve the rethinking of everything which has been done before and has been driven by communities of sciences, scientists who act to some degree on fate, just as their predecessors who support the current paradigm act on that. When a paradigm uh, is able to address and give us a conceptual framework for our problems, it's a good paradigm. When developments happen that make it no longer effective or efficient to solve our problem, we can be blinded by the paradigm, we can adhere to it without any real reason, and we get into paradigm paralysis, and then it is time for a paradigm shift, which is a revolutionary way of thinking about an old problem, and it's a dramatic and sometimes quote-unquote, violent shake-up in our perception. 
Uh, paradigm shifts start by having a, an existing paradigm in place, and Kuhn begins on the presence, on the premise, as I've said, that every person and entire societies have one or more paradigms in place that are passed down from one generation, and we have strong investments in existing paradigms. By this, Kuhn, Kuhn means many things, and it might mean the standing in a career or a profession or a linkage to various interests, and there is nothing scandalous about this. This is human nature. Um, we can see during the development of a paradigm shift strong resistance to anomalies and the preservation of the existing paradigm and fights to maintain it before the adoption of a uh, new paradigm. Um, this is the basic uh, concept of Kuhn shown diagrammatically here, and here are some paradigm shifters. And it is interesting that in uh, Bicto's magnificent oration, and I, 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 I congratulate him again yesterday, there was actually another paradigm shifter who is over here, Galileo Galilei, and here are a number of people in science who are people who have contributed to shifting the then current paradigm, and I would consider that one of our more recent pair of Nobel laureates in medical science, Marshall and Warren, in their work on Helobacter, have actually shifted a paradigm as well. I will now, now start talking about some personal perspectives. I started in transfusion medicine in 30, uh, 30 years ago in 1979. Again, practically to the day in September, I uh, joined the uh, pathology uh, service in the main Maltese hospital. And purely fortuitously, um, I, I ended up in, in this uh, strange field on which I had uh, absolutely no idea. My earliest mentors in transfusion included this guy over here. You can't see him very clearly. Could only find one picture of us together during this era. It was actually at my wedding. Uh, um, this, is, uh, this is myself uh, at the time when I was uh, perhaps uh, aspiring to look more like Fidel Castro. And, uh, and, this, is, uh, and this is Giri Rondiak, and uh, Giri Rondiak was and still is an eminent transfusionist from what was then Czechoslovakia and is now the Czech Republic. He taught me an enormous amount. And it is a great pleasure over the years to meet him now and again. This is at our most recent meeting in the beautiful city of Prague some years ago. Um, as Peter has indicated, I moved to Edinburgh to do my PhD. And here are my two closest mentors from that time. Uh, this, I think, uh, these are people who you know very well. Chris has certainly, Chris Prowse has certainly spoken at meetings of this society. This is Frank Bolton, then in the Edinburgh service nowadays. Uh, in charge of the blood service in Southampton. And this is us again meeting uh, in the speaker's uh, dinner at the ISBT in Cape Town a few years ago. And I leave it to you to assess which of these uh, handsome middle-aged men has uh, aged best. I, I, of course, <laughs> I, I, of course, have a view which um, I think it would be unpardonably arrogant to share. <laughs> it is the case, and I do not wish, as I said, to lump anybody uh, who has shaped and contributed to my thoughts with my uh, perhaps sometimes uh, uh, no compromise acerbic uh, um, uh, statements, but it is the case that over those years I formed my view of what I thought the paradigm of transfusion medicine was and perhaps is, although it is interesting that even presentations at this conference indicate that the shift is starting, which is immensely encouraging. And the paradigm consisted, as I saw it, that blood should be transfused as components. There was no question about this. We, you know, we need to transfuse blood as components because we need to get as much as possible from a unit of blood, and this is what the patients need anyway. We uh, had the um, ingrained concept, I think, certainly in my early years, that the, in terms of the safety issues, the safety issues uh, were related at the recipient end, and that blood donation was safe, and hence needed to be more and more increased. We had certainly the paradigm of voluntary non-remunerated donation. I think my remarks on this will certainly be among the more controversial amongst you. And this was linked to the uh, issue of self-sufficiency. Blood transfusion therapy, especially as practiced in mainstream hospital practice using components, was sheltered from the evidence-based medicine and efficacy is to be assumed from historical practice. And that Australia and Germany, Yemen, Monaco, the Galapagos Islands, Malta, you name it, has the safest blood in the world. Also, the hospital practice of blood transfusion 
needs to be sheltered from much of the kind of oversight of authorities and should be unquestioned. Declaration from the uh, meeting convened by WHO as being a fairly good reflection of at least key elements of this paradigm. As summarized over here, I have purposely uh, emphasized myself some of the elements and I will not go over them in detail because time uh, presses on. You know about the declaration and I commend you to it, the attention of the relevant web statement. I know some of you were there. Let me now start to look at some of these elements in this paradigm. Some of these points, I think, have already started to be addressed and have certainly some of them been addressed in this conference. Some of them, I think, are more controversial, but I think need to be exposed to vigorous debate. First is the issue of blood component therapy and its attendant issue of the role of fresh blood, an unfortunately semi-extinct therapeutic modality in our field and one which I enthusiastically contributed as much as I could in my past to rendering extinct. However, you all know that we now have increasing accrual of data suggesting that this is perhaps not such a good thing. And this is work from Phil Spinella and John Holcomb in the United States. These uh, uh, beloved colleagues are both involved in military affairs and this is John looking rather dashing in his combat fatigues. It's enough to make you want to surrender. And, uh, and this is, a, a, I think, a, a very key paper recently published but uh, strongly uh, um, visual, visible and discussed at last year's ASH meeting involving the use of fresh whole blood versus, if you like, multiple components. This is the fresh blood group. This is the component therapy group. And you can see that there are interesting clinical parameters which are undoubtedly better in the fresh blood group in these uh, combat-associated uh, trauma victims. Although, interestingly, there is more ARDS, more acute respiratory distress syndrome with fresh whole blood. And I leave you to speculate on the possible mechanisms of this. There is another interesting paper, very recent, showing the effect effect of whole blood in the management of hypovolemia from obstetric bleeding. And again, you can see that we have interesting here, and this is a well-structured uh, trial here, interesting discrepancies between the use of whole blood, packed red cells, and the combinations of blood products. Uh, I made it my business to actually write to the authors to ask, because it's not visible on the paper, on whether this was fresh whole blood, and yes, it was. And here is another paper, uh, very interesting, again from uh, John Hoop and Phil Spinella. Uh, it is uh, being presented at a meeting round about this time, which shows the issue of, uh, interesting issue, this is, um, I think, prospective data in relation to uh, mortality versus the age of red cells. And you can see this over here. I thought I'd show more recent data than the, more rec than the older publications which uh, have uh, accrued in this field over the past couple of years. So I think that there are to be thought about here. Um, this is an interesting abstract. It's from a, a, a large animal model, uh, a pig model. And in this pig model, um, uh, pigs were randomized um, to receive uh, trans by, by transfusion um, uh, stored red cells, uh, and the interesting thing is that this red cell transfusion was from leukodepleted blood relative to a sham transfusion model. And you can see uh, various deleterious effects, acute kidney injury, lung injury, cardiac injury, and so on in, in these animals. And I think that this is very interesting and should lead to increasing reflection. Um, and so I come to the um, interesting and sometimes vexatious issue of hemovigilance. And um, I must confess that I uh, have not been able to extract much um, Australian data. I know that there is data from New Zealand, but of course we are all uh, followers and admirers of SHOT, and this is extracted from the most recent uh, uh, reports of SHOT. Um, both for uh, the overall adverse event profile, and you can see here the, uh, the, the, the biggest uh, killer, which uh, we know is Trali. But I think I would like to draw your attention to the fact that in terms of the absolute numbers here, we're still talking about relatively modest effects. And my plea in this regard is not to discard hemovigilance. I do not for one moment pretend that these effects are not important, especially for the people at the hard edge of this problem. 
which are the patients we also are supposed to serve. But I think that when you consider that the emerging evidence on stored red cells indicate that we may well have a mega epidemic on our hands in relation to much bigger numbers of patients than we need to consider the question of relativities. I also draw your attention to something which I think is immensely interesting in the short report, which is the number of transfusions in the United Kingdom over the past 10 years. Observe the drop. I am not aware that people in the UK are dying in the streets because less blood is transfused. It's about a very favored, I freely admit, hobby horse of mine. And this is the safety of donation. The meeting of the society nine years ago in Perth, Kathleen Doherty presented data which caused much interest. Um, I think she didn't intend this. <laughs> uh, it happened to come hot on the heels of, our, of the TGA. Uh, I sometimes keep saying our, please excuse me, TGA. Of the TGA's uh, assumption of the oversight of fresh blood and our adoption of the Council of Europe uh, document, which its attendant hemoglobin cutoff levels as the standard of Australia. You know uh, much about this story, and I don't need to uh, belabor the point that we uh, obviously observed that a considerable number of repeat blood donors, particularly females, uh, in this country were suffering from clinically definable iron deficiency. And at the same time, I was struck by this study, published again in Australia, which showed that uh, self-reported low iron in women was associated with general health and well-being, and that iron deficiency was associated with decreased general health and well-being and increased fatigue. So obviously, we thought, as TGA at that time, that things needed to and this is the section 14 notice. This is a bit of uh, bureaucraties which was beloved and still is beloved by us in the TGA here. And it said that the delegate of the secretary, who is actually the person addressing you at the moment, gave consent for a relaxation of the hemoglobin levels um, in, in terms of what was permitted in this country. We had to do this because otherwise there would have been a catastrophic drop in the blood supply. I might add, it would have been nowhere as catastrophic as the apparent drop which the British seem to have managed to achieve uh, and which I showed you on the previous slide. But we did adopt this and it is, I think, disturbing that subsequent data showed that despite dropping the hemoglobin levels, the problem of iron deficiency in female donors persisted. And this uh, article here, this review from Bruce Newman, which advocates, of course, the use of iron replacement in these women. And it is therefore encouraging to note that in the RCBS's Medi News in March of 2009, we see the announcement of something which, in fact, I was involved in in its preliminary stages when I was still in my previous job. But um, I would say that why do we need to do a clinical trial in this country? This is an established form of addressing this problem. Carbonyl iron has been shown through the highest levels of evidence-based medicine to address this problem adequately. I refer you to this very uh, venerable paper here. So why are we waiting for? Why do we need to do a clinical trial here? And this is the TGA, in this instance, cooperating to ensure a smooth path towards addressing what I think is another underlying hidden epidemic in the safety of blood, which leads in fairly easily to the issue of ethics, because I do not consider that allowing donors to be harmed to be an ethical consideration in terms of its allegiance to the supply paradigm. This is uh, my very good friend and uh, many of you as well here in this room, Keith van der Poel, and uh, this year uh, Keith and I had occasion to cross swords in the correspondence column of Vox Sanguinis on that perpetually engaging issue of uh, voluntary versus non-voluntary or compensated or paid or whatever blood donation and its, cons its relationship to safety. I remind you of the most recent assertion in the Melbourne Declaration. The point I seek to make here is that we would be immensely foolish if we thought that blood safety was purely a function of whether donors receive some kind of compensation or recognition or not. This is a, an interesting study published in Germany which compares in a relatively localized environment donors who are actually compensated or not, and you can see that the donors who were compensated in this instance happened to be 
more safe in relation to the measurement of viral markers. Um, if you consider the issue on which uh, Keith and I debated in Vox Sanguinis, you can see that actually assessment of these donors in Lithuania, voluntary blood donors in Lithuania, had higher viral marker incidences than the compensated plasma donors of the United States. And this leads me to the whole issue of what is compensation and what is recognition. The DRC car, who is the president of the National Ethics Advisory Committee to the French government scientific body, the French are great believers in these uh, sophisticated bureaucracies, um, is certainly not an advocate of compensated donation. And yet he made what I think was an interesting statement in an article in Transfusion and Clinical Biology uh, just last year. And if you look at this interesting um, uh, uh, study uh, from Italy, not very widely known, but you can uh, download this academic paper from the net. It shows that in terms of recognition and in terms of other forms of compensation, such as days off, um, this certainly affects the willingness of individuals to donate. I can remember one of my former bosses of the TGA telling me that people will kill for recognition. I'm sure that this is the case. I do not wish for one instant to draw uh, aspirations on the motivations of blood donors in this country. But I think we have to be more open-minded than simply saying paid is good, paid is bad, and paid is good, uh, period. Because it is, again, a result of interesting sociological research, and my uh, eldest son, who's a sociologist, is in uh, the front row, so I really have to be careful what I say here, because these people are, you know, they, they have their own lexicon and they get pretty uptight. <laughs> Even, even more than we do. And um, it is the case that the most recent sociological literature abounds now with examples which show that blood donation is an act of benevolence rather than altruism. I remember with interest, fondness, and some, ora and some I must confess, emotion, uh, our late colleague Ian Young actually speaking about this at our meeting uh, many years ago. I cannot remember uh, which town. But he gave an erudite talk, which at that time was, uh, at that time, I, I must confess, I didn't uh, really think was was uh, all that interesting, but I went back to it, and uh, he showed that this question of benevolence rather than altruism is something which we need to be aware of, and that in fact blood donors do have the uh, concept that both they and the recipient gain from blood transfusion, and nothing wrong in this. A word on replacement donors. This was alluded to by Peter. It is again embedded in the Melbourne Declaration, which I understand received the um, endorsement of the Australian government, but that doesn't necessarily negate its value. And the, the, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that replacement donors are immensely important in parts of the world who are certainly not part part of the uh, landscape I inhabit now in terms of my bread and butter, and they're certainly not part of our landscape here in a first world uh, wealthy country, but they're immensely important in the third world, and I think it is not necessarily constructive to entirely ignore them, and this is data from Imelda Bates at a meeting which we had in Cambridge uh, in, uh, earlier this year, which shows that despite the assertions of WHO, that replacement donors are immensely important in the sub-Saharan uh, environment, that they are highly unlikely in realistic terms to be replaceable, and that therefore it is better to accept reality and address making them more safe than to adopt dog procedures. Of course, as a, regu as a former regulator, I have to say something about regulation. Um, this is a, a promiscuous slide. I've, uh, uh, I've had this slide for uh, many years and I have shown it at many meetings. And this is showing you the barriers to market access for therapeutic uh, goods. And of course the traditional regulator, in this case the TGA in this country, establishes safety, quality and efficacy as the barriers. And then of course there is uh, some uh, agency in this country, it's Medicare Australia. My wife who is also in the front row is a senior uh, member of the uh, organization there. And um, we establish safety, quality and efficacy and then they decide whether they want to pay for it. And um, essentially in terms of our field I think that we can see that safety has been driven primarily through precautionism. Quality is driven primarily through GMP. This is an issue which I have a view on. I had a substantial view when I was at the TGA. I couldn't say anything about it then. I've still got a substantial view and I don't want to bore you with it now because of time. I do think, however, that limiting the oversight of quality to blood through uh, the GMP paradigm is not a good thing. And I, I, I agree with you, James, that we should not look on blood as a pharmaceutical. I never have.
Efficacy, as I said, I think is mostly assumed. Cost effectiveness is generally ignored unless the politics say otherwise. If you look at the vast number of interventions which have sucked in millions of dollars of public money into the blood system over the past years, if you are to put these through a cost effectiveness hope such as used by the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, you wouldn't have a guarantee in a million years. So, what's the regulators? Well, I think that regulators have to say something about efficacy and do blood components actually work? Are they efficacious? Well, in terms of red cell concentrates, what we have is a function in relation to increasing oxygen delivered to the tissues. Well, does it actually happen? In terms of the VO2, yes, it does, but it, does, it, it only starts to kick in when the hemoglobin is about 50 grams per liter. At 80 grams per liter, in this paper by Walsh and others, uh, and this was actually a paper which was countering the thrust towards the non-use of stored red cells. But in this paper, they concluded that at 80 grams per liter, which is our idea of a conservative trigger now, there's no obvious effect. In terms of platelets, I, I remind you of the Plato study published last year um, and first uh, publicized in Macau. Uh, showing that uh, randomizing to low, medium, and high doses uh, resulted in the same clinical outcome. I continue to be interested and puzzled by the fact that studies um, very rarely have an impact on clinical practice, and one can philosophize at length on this ph phenomenon, and I will not uh, indulge myself and bore you. However, in relation to fresh frozen plasma, which I'm going to say a little bit more about. Um, there are two higher quality uh, trials, and they both e evaluated prophylaxis in relation to massive blood transfusion and bleeding, and they both demonstrated no benefit. I will make the assertion it is personal, but it is colored by my early training as someone who was trying to get the most out of blood in terms of one of the most labile of the components, that the move to component therapy was primarily driven by the need for plasma derivatives, which in terms of the number of patients they benefit is relatively modest, although immensely important for these patients compared to the recipients of fresh comp. And therefore, I think that regulation in a new blood safety paradigm has necessarily to involve itself in the question of head-on assessment of efficacy using perhaps modified, ways, modified in ways the traditional uh, uh, evidence-based mechanisms of other parts of therapeutics. Uh, in our work in the TGA, we were approaching this when we were um, attempting to um, establish a relationship with the agency from the country represented by our able chair here, and we developed this uh, tiered system geared to risk, where risk was seen as a function of manufacturing complexity. This was essentially a SOP to the uh, GMP freaks uh, in relation to the source and in relation to the use. And we came up with the idea that the established components should be exempt from efficacy assessment. I don't believe this anymore. Um, I just want to draw attention here to all my uh, dear, beloved colleagues in, in the regulatory system. This is my boss of many years, Terry Slater, it was never easy to work with, but he was, I tell you, <laughs> he was one of the best public servants I ever had the honor to serve. And we did a lot of good things together, many of which I cannot tell you because I'd be breaching the Crimes Act and we would both <laughs> go to jail. These are my beloved colleagues, Rita McLaughlin, the Office of Devices, Blood and Tissues, and Richard Pembry, my illustrious predecessor in giving this oration, and you all know Richard. And these are other colleagues, my very uh, uh, close collaborator and second in charge, Glenn Smith, Dr. Nanda Palan, who is in this audience, uh, uh, Peter O'Connell, and Trisha Wirt. And if there is any legacy in my work at the TGA, it is through leaving these people. For a, for a lefty, for an old socialist, um, I have some strange political heroes, and one of them is this man here. And uh, he spoke this line when he saw off he, the members of his wartime cabinet, which actually belonged to the Labour Party. He gave them a beautiful speech, had a tremendous Bob Hawke moment, as was his wont, and then proceeded to quote this beautiful line, and then went out on the election campaign and slandered them up and down the country, and proceeded to get hammered in the 1945 election. Okay. Blood safety. Well, blood has never been as safe. It's safer than ever, and our blood system is the safest in the world, as was um, asserted by a long series of politicians, including the recently uh, retired uh, senator and parliamentary of the TGA, Senator McLucas.
Um, I had the honor of uh, serving um, eight parliamentary secretaries in my job as public servant. I can tell you that serving as parliamentary secretary to the TGA is not necessarily a route to political advancement. Uh, two of these eight certainly advanced to the level of the cabinet, another two had to resign. One lost uh, her seat, she was actually the member for this illustrious town. Um, one uh, was disendorsed by his own party, and um, two of them lost the subsequent election and uh, disappeared in the oblivion of the back bench. And so we've got here also a, a, a United States uh, bureaucrat here asserting that her blood supply is actually safer than ours because it's not one of the safest, it's absolutely the safest. And you may remember Mo uh, Blackman, who um, was with you last year in Perth, asserting in his dramatic intervention, again in Cape Town, that blood kills, and I agree. And um, I think Rob Flower gave us a good exposition of the endogenous uh, viruses in this country, but the point I seek to make is that you may remember Willie Murphy at our meeting in, in Christchurch some years ago asserting that despite all the measures which we put in, all the money we throw, all the uh, tests, and donor questionnaires and deferral and whittling down of the donor base, we're also always going to be faced with the jungle of nature and that we are never actually going to have fully safe blood. And I personally uh, would like to see the uh, industry being more front-footed on this rather than in sometimes perhaps justifiably making triumphal statements about who we are. I want to give as an example this issue of, uh, in terms of dealing with one of the pathogens, the way in which the TGA and the Red Cross agreed not through consensus, agreed as a result of a negotiated settlement, I will not say consensus, on the question of dengue and how we reached, a, 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 I would say, a plank in a paradigm which was actually quite brave and which established as a uh, solid fact in this country that we were allowing the use of one part of the blood, whereas we thought another part was unsafe. I think that this was a remarkably successful uh, example of good regulation in place. I want to say something now about hospitals. Now, you all know that I'm a great fan of the Red Cross, as you can see here uh, with my dear friend uh, V. Armstrong in Hanoi uh, a couple of years ago. And at the uh, meeting of this society in, uh, in Hobart, some years ago I was, uh, I was sitting at a session minding my own business, you know, I mean, I'm a quiet bloke, and just sitting there, and I heard this voice whisper in my ear, this is utter nonsense. So, you know, I'm a, I was a bureaucrat then, so I was always in the market for good nonsense. You never know what you might, you never know what you might need for a ministerial brief. So I, I, perked up, I perked up my ears, you know, and as a result of hearing this interesting presentation, I wrote a, a letter to the Red Cross in relation to the issue of fresh frozen plasma storage in uh, hospitals, and uh, this is just part of this letter. Um, I, I distributed this letter widely. I didn't see any reason why there should be total transparency on this. And this led to an interesting series of events, including uh, one moment of fame, or perhaps it should be fame, in relation to uh, the media in this country, because uh, in his radio program on uh, ABC Melbourne, uh, Mr. Fain here received a call from an individual who preferred to uh, remain anonymous, saying that, you know, here was Farooja and he was, you know, very upset that the plasma was not being wasted, which, you know, I mean, when you're in this job, you just have to roll with the blows. And we received a lot of letters, some of them polite, some of them not so polite, some of them stating this in so many words, and some of them not. And I am very pleased that, again, not as a result of any particular consensus, but that we did engage with this distinguished society, and this was not an easy decision to, put, to push across the bureaucracy um, in terms of developing some improvement in relation to this issue of the storage of fresh frozen plasma in hospitals. And this is the document which is now on our website. I take some level of personal pride and I want to thank the President who I think in his distinguished um, stewardship of our society over the past four years, I would say that this is one of the cardinal achievements which he collaborated with and oversaw. And I want to why I think in the end we need to go further and why I think that our reservations about this practice were totally justified. And this is data, and I thank John Holcomb for this, it's not published yet, but this is uh, uh, currently unpublished data on a model which they've got in his uh, 
area where they are looking at the, exactly the question of storing FFP and its effect on uh, hemorrhagic shock in relation to these patients. And they show that basically the benefit of FFP is hardly linked to the coagulation factor content at all. And that in fact there is a benefit observable in relation to the effect of FFP through currently unknown uh, entities on the permeability of the endothelium which as you know in terms of shock is always increased. And they show that as, as the FFP is actually stored, this capacity to protect the endothelium is dramatically decreased. And so that by five days you're down to this low level. And furthermore other data on in shock, um, in terms of their mean arterial pressure, you can see over here in relation to the FFP transfusion uh, is much better maintained. There is a significant difference throughout when you are using FFP toward and immediately transfused than when you are transfusing stored FFP. So I'm watching this space with enormous interest and you know something, I think I'm going to be proved right again. I want to, before I go to some concluding remarks, I want to acknowledge um, some influences in my life. Some of them have already come up before you. I am a very, a very fortunate individual. I, I, like many of us, belong to the international family of our field, and here are uh, many of uh, the people which you know. Uh, and some of whom have, uh, have uh, spoken at our meeting. Um, I uh, wish to particularly salute those who have passed on. This is uh, my dear friend Klaus Hergman, who uh, taught me such a lot about 2-3-DPG before our group in Melbourne pipped him at the post in describing the half-CPD effect. Uh, he has passed on, as has Dean Robiard, uh, my collaborator in the World Federation of Hemophilia. I want to draw your special attention to this uh, photo over here, because uh, this photo is uh, historically significant for the society, because it includes two root Sanger orators. This was taken in Manchester in 1985. This was the then uh, group, uh, Committee of Experts in Blood Transfusion of the Council of Europe, and there are two Ruth Sanger orators in this uh, photo. We were hosted by dear Harold Ganson, who has also passed on, as have many immense uh, figures in our field, Arthur Hasse, Juani uh, Nevalina from Finland, and Jack O'Riordan from Ireland. Um, but there are two Ruth Sanger recipients here. Uh, myself, uh, looking suave and debonair over there, but infinitely less suave and debonair by this individual here, who um, was over there representing Australia, which puzzled me enormously because I, of course, have basic knowledge only of geography, but it was my distinct impression that Australia was not in the Council of Europe. And, um, and this is how I met, uh, I met a long-standing uh, friend and mentor who is in our uh, front row over here, Bob Beal. And, um, you know, I can remember Bob being um, immensely personable at this thing. We were addressed by the Deputy Minister of Health, uh, um, some obscure lord in the, in, the, uh, in the cabinet. She was uh, a lady, and she demanded to see the Australian. And I thought, you know, this guy's on a good thing. I, I need to do something here. <laughs> and I want to thank Bob and acknowledge publicly in the presence of my family for his enormous uh, uh, encouragement and advice and practical help for us to come to Australia as a result of this initial meeting. We have been uh, friends and colleagues ever since, so thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, life is infinitely too short and precious to be spent uh, entirely on work, and uh, as the years go by and I continue to advance in decrepitude, I uh, am increasingly uh, re resentful of, in fact, having to earn a living. And I want to say that there are other... There are other things in life, and I want to acknowledge uh, this man here who's been dead for the best part of 200 years, but Roland Hill invented the postage stamp, which was introduced in 1840 in the United Kingdom, and um, I have uh, endeavored to plow the fields of philately with some success as I have plowed the fields of blood banking. About, um, about uh, four years ago, I uh, was advised by a friend to uh, try my hand at painting, which I did. I don't pretend to have any uh, special talent, but these are uh, self-made uh, portraits of uh, various people, many of which have already appeared in this talk. So this is uh, Glenn again, and this is Rita, 
McLaughlin here is my uh, dearest uh, professional friend in the United States, my former counterpart and ever friend, uh, Jay Epstein. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is, uh, is my favorite dame, um, <laughs> dame commander of the British Empire, Professor Marcella Contreras. I seem to see something uh, reasonably good in the nose myself. <laughs> For all my life, I have been a devoted uh, follower of the uh, words and um, music of this man, uh, the Shakespeare of our time, and I have always found in the words of Bob Dylan something to suit every occasion. So you can see that I do cherish my memories and I do attempt to forgive those who I'm trying to help. It was great um, uh, two years ago to go to a concert in, uh, in, in Melbourne with the most important people in my life, and this is Adrian Farrugia, this is David Farrugia, and this, above all else, is Josephine Farrugia, who had a great time at his concert. The air was thick with the smell of certain substances. <laughs> And uh, we were, I think I was very emotional myself. I mean, Adrian is a, is a true believer. David and uh, Josephine tolerated our presence, particularly as I was, as I was paying for the tickets. But um, I, Adrian and I got, got immensely emotional, and it was great to see four generations of fans, you know, toddlers in the aisles and people in wheelchairs. And we all joined in the final uh, encore of Like a Rolling Stone, and the tears ran freely. Um, it is, despite the best effort, of Qantas that they are here today and I would like you to join me in thanking them for being with us today and for all the things they've done for my life. Some final thoughts plugged at random. Blood transfusion in terms of the whole blood modality showed in the dramatic ways, for example, of Blundell's 1837 patient in the Lancet that it could definitely save lives and the beliefs started there. Over the years blood became interdependent with an expanding medical industry. Blood is big business. It's big business in this country and businesses and empires and I mean all sorts of empires including bureaucratic empires were built. And so now we market the gift of life to encourage donors and we are at the risk of believing our own advertising. Having to fail to appreciate pathogen-related risks, in my early years in blood transfusion, we knew about uh, syphilis, we knew about hepatitis B. I would have to say that our posture towards them was fairly detached compared to the imperatives of assuring supply. And so now we've swung to the other way, that we focus on issues which are, in my mind, fairly marginal, while we are again ignoring major issues. We've had component therapy preached to the world by experts without regard to the local needs, and we still continue to damn whole blood. I was a great dammer of whole blood until a few years ago, without thinking the evidence about when it might be a good treatment. A word about consensus, and I'm drawn again into global warming, but uh, that's not the reason that I am actually showing this. This is another obscure politician who lasted, thankfully, uh, not more than two years uh, in the, uh, in, in the uh, British cabinet. But I think it, it, that her statements here, irrespective of this uh, somewhat extremist view about uh, skeptics being terrorists, I think the statement here is in relation to this business of um, uh, criticizing and attacking the concept that, you know, we must not have tension in debates and we must not vo voice provocative views and we must build a common consensus. I have to say I somewhat belong to the view, keeping in mind, as John Locke said, that new opinions are always su suspected and opposed for no other reason than because they're, they're new, that I would uh, conform to the thoughts of uh, Vildaski, another very interesting man. This guy doesn't believe in precautionism. He believes in trial and error. Look him up. Very interesting guy. But he did say that there must be more than one alternative policy, and they must come from more than one source. And there must be sufficient, this is the crucial thing, and this is why it is good to be in a democracy. There must be a sufficient dispersion of power in society so that competing sources of advice have a chance of being heard and acted upon. And I firmly believe that the best option is the one which persuades and can be justified, and the best process is the one which encourages argument. Remember, the strongest human instinct, according to Kenneth Graham, who wrote the delightful uh, classic, Wind in the Willows, is to impart information. The second uh, uh, strongest, and, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm indulging in that instinct, and I'm sure you're indulging in the second strongest at the moment. So, 
I have little to say about the new paradigm because I think it's already happening and it's encouraging. But we need to be vigorous in ensuring its embedment. Whole blood, I think, needs to become a product again. Not for everybody. I don't think anybody would advocate whole blood for normal volemic uh, alemia. That is crazy. But uh, we certainly need to think about the fact that if you're bleeding, you're losing blood, not red cells stored for 42 days in a, a mixture of toxic chemicals. Um, <laughs> Supply to patients should not be impeded by what I have called here somewhat euphemistically non-clinical interests. By this I mean the various interests, the various empires, bureaucratic, government, organizations, even august international organizations. We need to keep our focus on the patient. The blowtorch, perhaps a bit dramatic this, of evidence-based medicine needs to be applied to our field and not just in statements. Evidence-based medicine is very hard-nosed. When I think of the tortures of the damned, which my current uh, source of bread and butter has to go through to persuade regulatory authorities through uh, randomized clinical trials to register a plasma derivative, I think that you know, we need to look very much at that paradigm. Plasma for fractionation, given that recovered plasma is, in my view, best characterized at the moment as a necessary evil, I know that this is very controversial, should be collected for that purpose, and the example of vertical integration in the United States and its success, including by the largest fractionation agency in the world, which, as you know, is based in this country, uh, needs to be seriously considered. I have uh, made a plea for safety concerns to be focused on the real issues, and I say again that hospital transfusion medicine is part of the vein-to-vein -vein chain and needs to be subject to oversight. So, final thoughts, I would say... Going to that important professional body, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, 